explain uh, Mardi Gras more for the first time is a, a party. You can be who you want to be, where you want to be, however you want to be for that two week span of time. I can tell you this much. If you needed to be arrested so you'd have a place to eat and sleep, you better do something really bad to get arrested on Mardi, Mardi Gras. Mardi Gras to me is uh, waking up in the morning with your drawers down uh, and then underneath the table at the high hole lounge with the marker all over you and makeup and in a dress. You have to go full balls to the walls and party for that whole weekend. Well, I just don't even go. It's like a birthday party, it's like the Super Bowl, it's like just everything all rolled up into one and it's just, it's wild. <laughs> Regular people expressing their individuality and having a good time. I love this. <laughs> it's my idea of greatness. The music and the occasion go, one, go hand in hand. I mean, of course, I grew up here in the city listening to uh, Professor Longhair's early Let's Go to Mardi Gras when, back in the, the late 40s, I think, or early 50s when he recorded it. And you knew it was officially Mardi Gras when the radio station started playing that. I'm in Bodala, see, every year at carnival time, you make a new suit. I mean, um, um, the Mardi Gras, Mambo, Mambo, it just, so the music is so good, the music is just really festival. I mean, it's um, what I would call um, seasonal. I mean, it just, I mean, you can put on a Mardi Gras record right now and you would have a Mardi Gras kind of feeling. And we put on the second line, ba -da -ba -da. first thing you think is Mardi Gras morning. You know? The city has created a whole lifestyle based on this one day. So I think the music if it works around Mardi Gras, it works all year round. You can, you know, any time in June, if you hear that good Mardi Gras music and stuff, if you truly love this environment, then you love that song, you love that music, and it's gonna be a good night. Mardi Gras to me is a, a, um, a celebration, it's a, a carnival celebration uh, that represents um, a celebration that's really based out of Brazil because New Orleans is really the northernmost Caribbean city and New Orleans is influenced a lot by uh, culture from Brazil. I mean, even the second land music is influenced a lot by samba. So I, I look at carnival now, especially having studied a lot of uh, Brazilian culture, I see carnival as a sort of, um, as a, a no, more northern celebration of that same thing. I know for me and, you know, a lot of the drummer, Johnny Vodakovich, you know, I mean, the whole second line thing, I mean, is in full swing during Mardi Gras, of course, you have all kinds of bands walking around, and um, f to be a New Orleans drummer uh, means to, you know, really um, be involved in, you know, second line drumming in one way or another. Everybody's got their own take on it, and with Mardi Gras going on, you got all the different, you know, the Indians and the brass bands and even the marching bands, you know, um, going on. I, I take a little bit of inspiration from all that stuff. So, you know, definitely Mardi Gras influences me as a musician. And then, uh, you know, I'm sure that, yeah, the music definitely, I mean, what would Mardi Gras be with without music, you know? If you're just parading around and there's no music to parade to, it's like, yeah, so yeah, they definitely go hand in hand.
The wild Indians are people of African descent who mask as Plains Indians, Native Americans. And they create these fabulous costumes of their own design, outfits they call them, with huge plumes, feathers, beads, rhinestones. They bead patches, designs showing Indian things. <laughs> and um, they create these huge headdresses. And they have a, a group or what they call a gang of four, five, six or more guys costumed like this. And they have, uh, well, it's not like a parade which has a designated route. They go wherever they want to. <laughs> Mostly in the poor black neighborhoods is where they come from. So to see these creatures of incredible beauty emerge against the backdrop of slums that make your eyes sore. It's a wonderful thing to see. And then as they go down the street, they sing and chant, and you chant along with them, and guys beat the drums, and all the people from the neighborhood fall in behind them. So you have a huge contingent of people going down the middle of the street looking for another Indian gang so they can have a ritual confrontation. got down and you know it was always a different rhythm that was the biggest difference you know from you know being somewhere on Canal Street per se you know Canal and close to quarters or uptown where parades were going but once you're under the Claiborne overpass it was a different rhythm you know it was, it was real tight it was more you know more um, Afrocentric a lot of African rhythms and um, a lot of jazz but tight stuff more like the hey parky way unane type of sound than the traditional dun dun dun, dun type of sound so it was it was tight. It was always tight under there. I think Mighty Gras the um, time where kind of like everybody comes up. I mean, grandma, sister, auntie, people that sometimes, there have a lot of people in New Orleans that love to stay home. I mean, they love their houses, nice and comfortable. But Mardi Gras brings everybody up. I mean, people that you never seen, I mean, haven't seen in years. You, you might see them on Mardi Gras there. We'll take our RV and we'll go, uh, we, my husband will go park at um, Luna Gras at night and uh, around St. Charles Avenue and Lee Circle, and that's where we used to park by the bridge. Um, and it's a whole family, and the grandchildren and stuff, and we just stay right there and wait for the parade to pass. But my memories of Mardi Gras are uh, going down to Jackson Avenue to my aunt's house uh, and seeing the parade. You can see them from the front porch. And if you've ever listened to my song, Over By Your Mom and Them, which is the last cut at the end of the Ain't No Place to Pee Mardi Gras Day CD, uh, that's what Mardi Gras is all about. When I was a kid, uh, my parents used to take us, uh, pull us in a wagon. I can really remember this. I was dressed up like a little Bo Peep, and my brother was uh, a sheep. You know, he was my sheep. And uh, my mom and dad were uh, uh, two devils, and they pulled us through on down on Bourbon Street. Um, and when we were little kids, but anybody who's been to Mardi Gras recently realizes that that it doesn't work that way anymore. I mean, it's just gotten so, so big and so out of control because I think all the people in the hospitality industry realized, hey, this is something that a lot of other people outside New Orleans would enjoy. And over the years, it's, you know, 50 years or whatever, since I was a kid, it's been developed, you know, and, and gotten to this huge party. And now it's, you know, it's totally out of control. And, you know, I mean, it, it, uh, it contributes a lot to the city's economy. And 
Um, you know, with that uh, contribution to the city's economy uh, comes a lot of use of music at parties and, and stuff. You know, I mean, a lot of the bands get extra work. It's the real big money hitting season, I think, for most of the bands, you know. A lot of people in town, lots of big shows going on, and, it, and you can go see a great show any night. I mean, every night you can go out and just catch your favorite band jamming, you know. But in general, I, 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 uh, I think that the more popular bands tend to get the gigs sewn up pretty early on. Um, two or three months before. And it's just kind of the same with Jazz Fest for me. I mean, uh, I tend to do better in the off season when more people leave town. Uh, there's more kicks available. Well, for most of us, it means you get real bu busy. But for the last couple of years, it has not been that way for me. It's been very, very slow. Uh, I haven't really worked any Mardi Gras clubs or organizational balls in a couple of years now. Mardi Gras is one big party compared to Jazz Fest. Jazz Fest is all about the music. Uh, during Mardi Gras, of course, when you have a party, you got to have music. But to me, uh, musically speaking, uh, the music for Mardi Gras is mostly a party. It's like the same gigs that I, that I always do, be it uh, George Porter Jr., Papa Gross Funk, uh, my solo work that I do down uh, on, in the French Quarter. Uh, but of course, all those gigs turn into Mardi Gras affairs, you know, lots of Big Chief, lots of uh, Hey Pocky Way, Mardi Gras Mambo. Uh, all those songs get played a lot more than, say, uh, in the middle of July or, you know, September, October, something like that. I have a tendency to do more, uh, like, uh, Mardi Gras tunes, like Mardi Gras Mambo or Big Chief or some Meters tunes or Hey Pocky Way. And, some Indian music. The one thing I found as a street performer and also later um, as a club musician, during Mardi Gras, the music really takes the side stage uh, or the, the become more of a, of a, of a sideshow to the main event, which is Mardi Gras and um, the costumes and the, the party and the, 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 the drunkenness and the, the nudity and everything. Um, so it, it can be a very frustrating time for a musician who's trying to make a living. You know, these people are not subdued. <laughs> they are there to party. And you know, in any given night, any club, within that two weeks, there's always someone naked on the table. I mean, you can't avoid that, you know? Masking is the oldest part of Mardi Gras. It's a, it's a tradition that goes back to the ancient carnivals of Greece and Rome and to the early pagan festivals. It was all about transformation. And masking is the most, the mask is the most essential ingredient to the festivities of all. People create costumes. They don't just go to the Halloween store and buy some kind of corny thing like they do on Halloween and other places. I mean, people spend a lot of time creating their costumes, deciding what they want to project, and then making the costume. The more sober I am, the more serious I get about the costume. And I got some friends, and especially one Jenny Baggett this year, I was like, man, I can't spend that much on a costume. She said, there's no such a thing. There's no such a thing as too much money for a Mardi Gras costume, okay? That was her exact one, okay. <laughs> so it's, you know, with people like that around, you just you go all out. And I really, I'm really inspired by that. I think it's great. If you don't mask, you're not really in New Orleans and you're not Mardi Gras. The people who don't mask are keeping themselves out because they're not in it. They become spectators. And why you would only want to be a spectator in something so grand as Mardi Gras, is uh, something that would puzzle me. When you see regular people expressing their individuality and having a good time, I love this. <laughs> it's my idea of greatness. <laughs> Amen. was a Catholic, French, Creole city. It was not American. It reluctantly became part of America with the Louisiana Purchase. And 
the American visitors to New Orleans into the middle of the 19th century were horrified at what they saw here. People drank, they gambled, they wore masks and put on costumes. They had fun. And uh, the Puritans were just horrified. Uh, and they still are. So they should stay away. Let me tell you a little story about hell. Hell is not a place of funny games. Hell is a place of torment. But don't worry, it won't last forever. Then you get to stand in the great white throne judgment. At the great white throne judgment, you'll be judged. I mean, I'm a devout Catholic, you know? I mean, and that gives me a little freedom that I, that I, I can come out here, I can mix with these people. I'm with my old lady, you know? I'm not doing nothing right. But I see these dudes preaching, man, and they're fanatical. They're violent, man. It's like, you know, they scare me more than if I lost my kid in a crowd, I would rather be a with bikers than with like <laughs> Jesus freaks. Sorry to say it, dude. That scares me, you know? Because they might whisk him in and give him some cheese sandwiches and I'll never see him again, you know? They're gonna brainwash him. And dude, it's freedom of choice. <laughs> God gave me a free will and I chose Jesus Christ. About four or five years ago, um, I, I figured I, said I hadn't made myself a costume yet. I've been living here for a while and gone through a few Mardi Gras. So I just cut a little mask out of a piece of cardboard, you know, some box or something. And I was walking down Royal Street towards the middle of the quarter from Esplanade, and um, the freaks were lining up. They were like gathering their masks, and they had a cross with the back trucks from a uh, skateboard. skateboard pulling it which to me like i was i just make it I, easy on them i was like man you know they're they're supposed to be dragging this thing not rolling it but they had the, like the a, it, it wasn't plugged yeah. in yet this is my my first real mardi gras moment i had two cans of mickey's 16 ounces ice cold and i was kind of like okay this is cool so I decided to go at their pace and kind of follow them without, you know, getting in their way because they're right in the middle of the street, and I was just on the sidewalk, going about two or three blocks. This old guy standing outside, I think Harry's or one of the bars there, says, "Lordy God!" And they all kind of you know, turned at each other <laughs> nervously, but they kept walking. <laughs> and I was, you know, I was, I was looking at the, you know, the crowd that's there getting fucked up and having fun on the sidewalk, looking at these guys that are, they've got their mechanized cross coming down the street behind them. And um, about four blocks later, this kid, some gutter punk, yells, "Freaks!" <laughs> and one of the front guys carrying the cross says, "Incoming!" And they all go, incoming, incoming, incoming. And then it kind of hit me. They were really, like, armed to the teeth and ready to fight. But that was, I don't know, that was kind of my uh, whole juxtaposition Mardi Gras experience. I work with a, a street ministry team in Milwaukee called Heartfire Ministries. And we do a lot of different things in the inner city of Milwaukee. We work with food programs. We work with food pantries and clothing shelters. And we work with some of the other... Uh, uh, hot meal programs to help people any way we can, um, and and it's um, it, it, that's why our goal is to really help people in every way that we can. We want to help their physical and in, in every way we can, but we also want to help them spiritually, and that's and that's why we have come to tell people about Jesus. We've had a mixed response. I've only had a few people that got really angry and said, "This is our party. We don't want your God here." Well, newsflash. 
it, God is God, and He's everywhere, and you can't get away from it. I'll give you an example, and I don't, I don't mean this uh, in any disrespect. I'll give you an example that I told people when I went back in years past. When I look at what God wants of people, and I look at how great He wants their life to be, and I look at Mardi Gras, and, and I don't mean any disrespect to the people, but when I know the joy that God wants for people's lives to be, I think of Mardi Gras as kind of like a... I don't know any other way to use it, and I don't mean just I kind of like a kind of like a cesspool, and and I'm here to get as many people out of that cesspool as I can, and go. You know, there's a better life. There's a better life for you. That's not religion. That's advertising. Um, Mardi Gras again is is founded in a religious history. It was a religious festival all the way back to the Greeks. Um, it has religious significance, it had religious significance for them, and it has religious significance for us. Um, for a bunch of maniac evangelicals to come here with their microphones to supposedly proselytize, I mean, I don't know how many souls they think they're going to save on Bourbon Street or on Jackson Square, but uh, I think really in the end they're coming just to ogle to see the thing that drives them so mad. But that's not religion, that's just foolishness. Woo! Lundi Gras, you have to really prepare for. When you're starting to get into the, the whole Mardi Gras swing, it starts like two weeks ahead, sometimes even three weeks ahead. And the gigs start rolling in, the crowds start moving in, but Lundi Gras, my old band, anyway, I used to play in a band called Irene and the Mikes, and we would play at a club called Checkpoint Charlie's down on um, Frenchman Street in Esplanade, and we would play from 10 at night to 8 or 9 in the morning. That was our Lundi Gras. Every year for Lundi Gras, we held the record. The crowds were fun. It was really, I had bodyguards. It would get that wild, you know? And uh, it was such a little club. People would just be packed in. Just a lot of drunk people partying, having a good time. And most of the time, I would, I would make it out on the street. I would open the doors, the sun would blind me. And I would roll down the street for maybe two or three hours. And then I just couldn't take it anymore. I would just drop from exhaustion. My favorite place, I think, at the, uh, that I've found so far is to hang out is around Cafe Brazil on Frenchman Street. It's right out of the quarter. Um, and for those of us who were living downtown, it was sort of the alternative scene um, to the French Quarter. Um, not too many tourists made it there. There was usually samba music, so a little, a little taste of uh, the Brazilian carnival, and um, you know, people just kind of hanging out in costume.
my favorite part of town that has uh, Mardi Gras enthusiastic activity happening because there are a lot of costumes and a lot of craziness. Um, lately, the past few years, um, the police tend to come through on their horses and um, keep an eye on things because there has been some bizarre events like people lighting bonfires in the street. subtler environment. Uh, it's about play and having fun, enjoying yourself, being expressive. Well, it's magical. It's not about demeaning anybody else. Uh, one of the finest cultural expressions on the planet. And this is the epicenter right here, the corner of Frenchman and Charters. explain uh, Mardi Gras more for the first time is um, a party, you know, an outdoor, indoor, wherever you want to be, anywhere type of party where you can be who you want to be, where you want to be, however you want to be for that two week span of time. And uh, just be careful because you might find out more about yourself than you, than you thought you knew. Mardi Gras to me is uh, waking up in the morning with your drawers down uh, and the uh, Underneath the table at the high hole lounge with marker all over you and makeup and in a dress and um, wondering what in the heck happened. The drawers all of a sudden you have a dress on the drawers. You have to go full balls to the walls and party for that whole weekend. I well, just don't even go, you know. It's hard to jump into it midstream. Being wedged in between your shotgun apartment and the hot water heater at four in the morning by your landlord who lives next door because he saw that you had been drinking and decided that it might be fun to give you some 80-year-old brandy to top you off after an 11-hour bender. Then your landlord cradles you in his arms and carries you into your apartment. And that's when you pee all over him. That's what Mardi Gras is to me. Mardi Gras is so huge, it's like a giant safety valve for America. I think it's like a really good example to everybody, you know. Because everyone gets there, there's a million people wasted on the streets, 100,000 of them on E or something, right? 50,000 on cocaine, everyone else that can get a mushroom or a joint is fucking doing it. People that don't normally do, do, you know. People run away. I met one lady that left her husband and her two teenage boys that wouldn't stop looking at tits. And fucking I met her three months later living with a belly dancer in the lower garden district. She just like left and they left her and they fuck off and not going back to Green Bay. <laughs> and that sort of thing happens. Like dreams happen right in that time. You got a million people. So you got them, but there's all kids there, all mixed in, everyone's mixed in. And like there's not great stories of like dramas on Mardi Gras. If you needed to be arrested so you have a place to eat and sleep, you better do something really bad to get arrested on the night before Mardi Gras. It's a party to the left or party to the right when it kind of evolves. You know, one year maybe you know, maybe the same people at the same place, but it's a whole another type of vibe, you know, in New Orleans itself, you know, it kinda breeds, you know, like the streets, they got all the big potholes because it's always shifting and moving. And Mardi Gras is a bit the same way. I would describe it as a, a shifting and moving, ever-changing party to kind of get out all the things you, you thought you may have um, had in you and uh, some things you may not know you have in you. It's all about excess. I mean, it's traditionally about excess. Ever since I've come down here, I, I came down for Mardi Gras a couple of years before I moved down here. It's kind of what got me to move down here. It gets excessively excessive for Mardi Gras. And uh, you just do kind of just do anything you can get your hands on, basically. <laughs> anything you can get away with. And inevitably, I always end up at the end of it on Wednesday or Thursday in, in the fetal position 
crying my eyes out. <laughs> Asking myself, what have I done? Do you want to see blood? Yeah! Yeah! yeah. 452 pounds! He wants to kick your ass! Go! Absolutely. What do you think is going on right now? To the fucking death! It's the Hard Times Bike Club takes on any, any, any opponent. You see that man right there? Six for a pure aggression and murderosity. and tragic event at the same time. Some Mardi Gras back, I believe it was 1980, I was playing music at the Fairmont Hotel in uh, one of the rooms open to the public on the bottom floor, right, right in the lobby. And uh, a gentleman, looked like in his late 70s, died right across the doorway. Probably had a heart attack. His wife was with him, they were from out of town. But of course, everybody there thought he was just passed out. And they were lifting up his head and trying to give him drinks, stepping over him. And it's a very busy time of year. And uh, our coroner, uh, he also plays music, plays trumpet. And not that it's to blame. However, it took about two and a half or three hours for somebody to get over there and proclaim this poor guy deceased so they could finally cover him up and get him out of there. But apparently, it looked like he was having a pretty good time before they took him out. I, my parents grew up, and I grew up on Dumain Street until I was about 10. And I only remember going to one Mardi Gras because my mom thought it was getting a little too violent. Not that it's violent, it's dangerous. That's a lot of people drinking to, to tote your children around. My dad took us to Zulu and was hit in the head with a coconut, so that was the end of that one. I remember I was so drunk last Fat Tuesday that I couldn't walk. So I took my car. It's an old joke. I was born in 1940, in December. And when I was in 1941, I was a year old, and then that was Pearl Harbor. And there was no carnival during World War II. So um, in 1946, carnival was revived. The, the Mardi Gras after the war. And uh, that's when I saw my first parade. I was five years old. Most of the time when I was growing up, my mom or my father would drop me off, I mean, my brothers and sisters at my grandparents' house, uh, say on Friday before Mardi Gras. And uh, 
he would then just take us to parade after parade after parade till we dropped. But he's still throwing things and, you know, it's all pretty cheap, uh, you know, not too important uh, trinkets to have. It's just the thrill of catching a bead is great. The throws are much more than it was back then. And remember ladies, young ladies especially, the beads only cost a nickel. Don't flash for nickel beads. I've never flashed in a gay <laughs> but like, perfect moment last year, um, I brought my nephew, he was my brand new drummer, and that was the first time he saw girls flashing from my cross. <laughs> and it was so wow. I mean, he was missing the whole drum set and everything. So, it's just a lot of fun. You can't really explain Mardi Gras. You gotta come and do Mardi Gras. You know? When I like about Mardi Gras is that you have all these million people in the streets, plus all the residents in New Orleans. And they're all having a ball. And they're all having their fun in their own way. It's a celebration, but it's not just a party. It's not. It's not a celebration like, it's not a 4th of July celebration. It's not a Yoo-Hoo, Yahoo celebration. Um, it's, uh, it, it's profound. And it, it's a, as much a part of New Orleans as, as anything. It, it is ingrained in the psyche of the city. People are bringing things, you know, out of themselves and they're acting in a certain way and they become something through their costume or through watching other people's costume and it, it just and it always seems like it's sunny blue skies and sunny even if it's not and that's just the vibe i have it's like everything is shimmering and glimmering and glittering you know it's like ah, people are at their fullest potential both ways, good and bad, so to speak. You know, they're just, they're loaded with this day. And, and it's, it feels like a little miracle that there's a, you know, a day like that. This is one hell of a place. Oh, we all seem so nervous. Let's do ourselves a service. Stop trying to keep up this pace. I keep swimming in this big pond A little boy who lost his shoes I feel this dead calm Inside the big storm Living with the ash Wednesday blue Thank you. 